Okay. All right, so we'll get started. Um, very exciting uh, talk we have in store. So I will introduce our speaker. We have Dr. Wanda Burton. So Dr. Wanda Burton is an assistant professor in the Department of Health Science. She teaches undergraduate and graduate health disparities courses. Dr. Burton also teaches an interdisciplinary research methods course to graduate students across multiple departments within the College of Human Environmental Sciences. Dr. Burton's research interests include health equity, and she has investigated racial health disparities in low birth weight and mental health. Dr. Burton has also examined other social justice issues such as sexual assault and dating violence on college campuses and inequities facing the LGBTQ communities. She has co-authored papers in the Journal of Health Disparities Research and Practice, American Journal of Health Education and Sex Education, Sexuality, Society and Learning. In addition to her teaching and research, Dr. Burton has professional public health experience in the community addressing poverty, disability rights, and gender violence. Dr. Burton's research informs her service as a director of diversity and inclusivity Dr. Burton works with the interdisciplinary team to improve diversity, equity, and inclusion for the College of Human Environmental Sciences. She is a member of the Academic Diversity Council and works with the University of Alabama's Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Dr. Burton received her bachelor's degree in psychology, a master's degree in human development and family studies, and a PhD in health education, uh, health promotion from the University of Alabama. So we are very excited to have her here to talk about focus groups. And as we begin to expand our research here at CCN, we definitely welcome her expertise and potential collaboration. So let's give her a warm um, hand of applause. And welcome Dr. Wanda Burton. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Hello, thank you guys for inviting me. This is uh, exciting. I do hope we have some time for uh, interaction to learn about how you guys are using focus groups and your research as well. So I am excited to be here. Um, let's see, am I using this? Okay. So uh, the title, Making the Invisible Visible, um, I really like that title. That's not my, um, that was not my words. This is actually from a, um, study that you'll hear me reference uh, a lot because, uh, because of the way that they talk about focus groups. So what focus groups did in this other study was make the invisible visible. And so that's exactly what I saw with the study that I conducted. And so I will reference those things. So I use focus groups within a transformative mixed method approach. And so um, after this session, you should be able to explain the purpose of focus groups uh, describe the use of focus groups with stigmatized topics, and then compare focus groups with individual methods of data collection like surveys and interviews. So I thought we'd start with the definition. And uh, the definition of focus groups has, has even changed over time. And so um, it's important to pay attention to how they change. So it starts with a uh, Beck in 1986 saying that it's an informal discussion among selected individuals about specific topics. And then Kruger goes on to say in 98 that it's more group interviews on a particular topic led by a trained moderator and that the goal of the focus group is to provide useful insights on the topic. Uh, Kruger went on to say that focus groups are a carefully planned series of discussions designed to obtain perceptions on a defined area of interest in a permissive, non-threatening environment. And uh, Kruger, I consider, is the go-to person on focus groups. So if you need like a how-to focus group manual, then this is the person that you Google Richard Kruger. Uh, he, he provides um, a lot of free resources, videos, and publications on how to conduct focus groups. And so he also added that the focus group work best when participants feel comfortable, respected, and free to give their opinions without being judged. Can you guys hear me okay? Okay. Um, but you'll see from these definitions that focus groups have been described both as discussions and as group interviews. And I think that's an important distinction. So however you use focus groups will likely depend on your worldview or your research paradigm that you're working from. And so uh, this image um, 
I thought was really helpful in helping to see kind of the difference between these two ways of thinking about focus groups. And so when they're described as focus interviews, you can see that there is a stronger interaction between the researcher or the facilitator and each of the participants. And so that darker line uh, represents that stronger interaction where in a this type of focus group, you have the researcher asking each participant basically the same questions. It's much more structured. Um, that data is much more likely to be producible, um, reproducible. It is also used when you're trying to confirm or refute a particular hypothesis. So this less structured group, or how they described it as less structured group, has a stronger interaction between the participants and so in this way, the interviewer or the researcher kind of sits back and watch, watches that interaction. Uh, and regardless of which of these two options you take, uh, focus group interviewing uh, has been described as generally involving dialogue in which individuals present their experiences and perspectives related to a research topic and that the group finds some common means for representing and explaining areas of agreement and disagreement and that individuals become more conscious of, the, uh, of their own perspective because of the group dynamic, and also that the group becomes more conscious of, of each of the collective elements that the individual brings. And so regardless of which kind of style you use, that the uh, strength of the focus group, what many suggest is that this potential synergy that happens with a group uh, gives you insight, collective insight, that just doesn't happen when you're doing individual data collection. But even uh, thinking about focus group in terms of a binary approach has been uh, critiqued and challenged. And so uh, Denzen and Ryan goes on to say that focus groups should not be thought about as a binary. In fact, even this, the way that they described it in terms of uh, these three different uh, ways, they said this is really an oversimplification as well. And so they use this table um, to conceptualize a theoretical approaches to how someone might use focus groups. And although it's an oversimplification, it does demonstrate some important distinctions for how focus groups might be used. Um, and so you can see in the first um, column, the one that is most adjunct to quantitative methods. You might find post-positivist or quantitative researchers using this. Again, this is that uh, hypothesis uh, generating or pre-testing. So the focus group provides information about how a different group, perhaps uh, based on gender or race, experience a program or a treatment. And uh, survey researchers also use focus group for pre-testing questionnaire, wording, or to examine how different groups interpret different items. And so these kinds of focus groups um, are more likely to be performed in a lab setting with some kind of randomized sample. And again, these are the ones that we tend to think about as wanting to try to, if our goal is to replicate in order to generalize findings, and this is probably the model that you use. The one in the middle is more traditional qualitative method, um, and it says that the focus group structure is more open to variation. So here's probably where you have the most kind of gray area. It can kind of do whatever you need it to do, but the uh, goal here might be to build theory, and it's used to access hard to reach populations or on sensitive topics. Um, you might use a structured or unstructured approach, depending on your background, um, and that the, conducting these focus groups um, really depends on the researcher's stats and how they view the importance of neutrality. And so uh, those of us that come from a quantitative background, you might have that objective focus, um, more um, quantitative objective focus, whereas folks from the qualitative background, they use a more subjective focus. And so you might see some gray area there. And then that last uh, column, the qualitative interpretive practice. Here's where you see that the goal, uh, the purpose of the focus group really shifts to something a little different. Um, and it, the goal is to uh, emancipate or to construct knowledge. And so this one is especially important or what I've seen used most often when you are trying to understand the experiences of marginalized communities. And so it's often conducted in a natural setting, um, in a safe space, and it's really politically laden. So you have completely gotten away from this idea that you are just an objective observer. You are now taking on a political stance by saying, I'm going to deal with this topic that uh, many consider um, too politically charged to deal with, 
But as a researcher, you're taking on that stance um, and dealing with, you know, whatever the topic is for marginalized communities. And so this is actually how I have used uh, focus groups in this kind of interpretive practice. And the definition or the purpose that uh, can I use is from Penny, who, um, Barbara Penny, describes the purpose of focus groups is to uh, explore group interactions centered around the experiences of marginalized communities. And so she suggests that participating in focus groups offers the opportunity to co-construct interpretation, empowers participants through support and validation, and may even facilitate resilience and action-oriented solutions. So this is more probably like what you might see in a community-based participatory research approach. Um, and I also found uh, a lot of this already being done in uh, the uh, Journal of Advanced Nursing. So there are nurses that use this uh, approach quite often in dealing with some of the topics that they're looking at. But I did think that preparing for this type of an approach to focus groups is a bit different. And so I, in addition to the typical things that Kruger might suggest, I found these uh, suggestions more help, or in addition to those things, as helpful. And so focus groups using this egalitarian approach or a feminist approach really requires an additional level of preparation. And so I uh, used, I'm pretty sure all of this uh, with the five, number five is from that Journal of Advanced Nursing. And so it's a really good reference if you're interested uh, in this approach. And it's a feminist approach um, and it's a way to look at focus groups uh, with the goal being to um, first and foremost, consider the welfare of the research participants, to put those things above um, anything that the researcher might be interested in, including the acquisition of knowledge. And so um, I thought that that promoting an egalitarian approach uh, really worked well with sensitive topics, stigmatized topics, and vulnerable populations. Um, so this paper is based on the experiences of three authors using uh, feminist methods in separate but similar research traje trajectories, uh, including low-income women in South African uh, country of Malawi, women diagnosed with schizophrenia in the United States, and uh, rural indigenous women in Peru. And so uh, I picked up this model in doing uh, this study that I focused on uh, gendered racism within black college women here at the university. Um, but this egalitarian approach is particularly useful for studies um, focused on experiences with people who are socially, culturally diverse, um, where the common perspective and approach to research um, really enables us to share from one another as we seek to promote that equalized relationship uh, between the researcher and the research process and the participants. And so there is really a decentering of what the researcher wants and really focusing on what the researched wants. And this is, again, particularly important when you're talking about marginalized communities or talking with marginalized communities. Um, in addition to your typical IRB-approved incentive or compensation, uh, it is suggested that uh, it's important to really think about how incentives and compensation can be used for working with these groups because it helps to add value to their voice. So participants coming from a place that has been marginalized might not think of themselves as having, having anything to add of value to researchers. And so thinking about um, what can I do to get you to believe that your voice actually would be meaningful for us as researchers. And so that does certainly provide for a more nuanced conversation with IRB, but there are published works that have used, uh, you know, ways to compensate and incentivize uh, focus groups uh, for folks like this that have been um, published. Certainly the uh, venue selection is important in order to make folks feel comfortable. It should be accessible and convenient uh, to all participants. Um, Parking here on campus is, is quite difficult. Also, obviously, the university is intimidating for a lot of community people. So getting out in the community and, and selecting a space that makes sense for them is really important. I found that uh, making sure that participants sit down first and so that I take the seat that uh, they kind of leave for me is a good way to take on that approach. I also try to pay special attention to the space in terms of providing uh, food, things that might make them relax. We listen to music. I think we probably had Beyonce playing whenever they first came in and then I'll ask them what songs that they want to listen to because we allow for some time to just kind of eat and listen to music and, and really get used to each other before we dug into a, a difficult topic. 
Um, the size of the focus group is important as well. I'm sure you've seen multiple uh, uh, kind of sample sizes that are supported in the research anywhere between three and 12. Uh, you, you'll find support for that, which typically is around six to eight. And then also, uh, particularly with um, sensitive topics, you, you may have to do a bit more um, building of trust in order to uh, encourage that self-disclosure. There is um, the, a challenge for preparing for these type of focus groups is over-disclosure. Um, particularly using a feminist approach um, and, and doing all of these things to make folks feel comfortable and feel equal, then they may have a, um, they may feel like they've overshared after the fact, so there may be some regret. And so just taking care to make sure folks feel comfortable with what they're sharing to minimize the chance that they might regret oversharing during the uh, process. Obviously, with focus groups, one of the challenges is that you might silence some of the members, so depending on how many folks and how they're speaking up, so taking care to uh, make sure you're hearing from different voices and, and no one is being silenced because they might have a divergent opinion. And then uh, finally, which I think is probably one of the bigger issues, is the, the skill of the facilitator. So the facilitation. So you... Um, particularly with this type of focus group, you're really moving away from that objective stance. And so how comfortable do you feel in having a natural conversation with your participants? Um, I think that, uh, you know, takes some practice. Uh, how comfortable do you feel displaying emotion with your participants? Because basically you are trying to recreate a real uh, organic conversation or relationship, but you're doing it in a very condensed time. And so that might... Uh, that might require additional um, training or practice. Uh, certainly sense of humor has been um, utilized and seems to be helpful. Uh, and then being adaptable. And I'll certainly talk a lot, of, lot more about the ability to be adaptable even within the, within the focus group. Um, that seems to be very common amongst um, research that take on this approach. And so that's kind of how I prepare, but now I wanna kind of shift focus and get into the actual study that I uh, conducted. And so using a public health definition of racism, we understand racism can be described as a system of structuring opportunities and assigning value based on the social interpretation of how one looks. It unfairly advantages some and then disadvantages others. And so we understand that racism is a social determinant of health, but it's also a structural determinant of health. Um, so pretty sure you guys are very familiar with those uh, terminologies, but thinking about social determinants of health, those are your economic stability, education, the social and community context, health and healthcare, and then the neighborhood and the built environment. And racism is kind of tucked away in how we understand social and community context. As a structural determinant of health, um, well, I'll say as a social determinant of health, it might inform how we interact with each other, but at a structural determinant of health, it really requires a different, um, a more nuanced understanding of, of um, racism. And so I use Dr. Jones's framework, um, of the, again, a public health definition, so that we can understand racism on multiple levels to understand how it operates as both a social and a structural determinant of health. Uh, and so Dr. Jones provides a framework of looking at racism as institutional, personally mediated, and internalized. And so at that institutional level, uh, here's how it is able to be a structural determinant of health. And so it creates the normative experiences of differential access to goods and services and opportunities of society by race. So it's at this level that we kind of understand and, and expect racial health disparities. So we kind of understand those things as normalized. This is institutional racism. It's often seen as normative, sometimes legalized. It often manifests as inherited disadvantage. So it's structural because it has been codified into our institutions and customs and practice. So there is no identifiable perpetrator. Um, it's just kind of an acceptance of how things are. So in institutional racism manifests as inaction in the face of need. And so I always think about when I first learned as an undergraduate about the racial disparity of low birth weight or infant mortality for black women in the South. And I thought, oh my God, no one is like, this is not all over the news. 
well, it's kind of accepted as normal. And so that's how I understand institutional racism as operating as normal. Obviously, this one um, is probably probably the larger issue and it, and it impacts and informs how we understand that personally mediated as well as internalized levels that we don't al always talk as much about. Um, but at the interpersonal or personally mediated level, this is what you normally think of as racism. This is acts between people, acts of omission as well as commission, um, where you have different assumptions made about one's abilities, intentions, or motives. Um, it can be unintentional or intentional at this personally mediated level. And then finally, at the internalized level, again, very little attention, I think, paid to this issue. Um, but at the internalized level is where you see the acceptance of negative expressions or negative messages by members of stigmatized races about their own ability and worth. And uh, it's seen as embracing whiteness and a self-devaluation. So regardless of the level, there's plenty of research that suggests that racism negatively impacts mental health, which is my focus, but it also impacts physical health as well. Um, but particularly, I'm interested in looking at depression and psychological distress. And so racism at multiple levels have uh, shown to increase depression and psychological distress. But we also know that women, more so than men, report higher rates of depression and psychological distress. And so that puts uh, Black women and women of color at an increased risk for depression and psychological distress because of issues around race and sexism. One study found that women of color experience more stress associated with racism and sexism than with employment and finances, lifetime victimization, and social network loss. So really, it is the biggest factor for women of color that creates stress. And so that brings us to this concept of gendered racism. And so this is a hybrid form of oppression that, that is based on both racism and sexism. Um, it's really built out of this idea of intersectionality. It's a gendered and classed form of racism that any person of color may experience, although here I'm talking specifically about, about black women. Intersectionality theory um, suggests that there's a simultaneous experience of oppression that's specific to women of color um, and that uh, Crenshaw, uh, posited that as a result of the anti-racist and feminist movements failure to address how these oppressive systems interlock, that black women particularly, but women of color were being kind of left out of the conversation. So women of color experience a racism differently from men of color and that uh, women of color experience a sexism that's different than uh, from white women. And until we kind of get at that level, we are missing a lot of the uh, stressors and areas that um, require our attention. For Black women, gender racism oft oftentimes manifests as representation, images, and offensive comments that are specific to Black women. And so common perceptions around gender racism include uh, being silenced and marginalized, ignored or challenged like in a professional setting. Again, this can happen with anybody but we're seeing it, it's a different way that it happens with this particular group. Uh, being mistaken for the help, this oftentimes happens with many women of color. Um, they might be mistaken for the help while they're out shopping or being treated as the help in professional settings by being required to take on more service work, uh, say for example, in higher education. <laughs> uh, also experiencing um, sexual harassment and violence. Um, this comes from an erroneous notion based on the idea that black women are more inherently uh, sexually permissive and uh, this idea of a strong black woman. So uh, that all black women, this is an ideology that has been um, with us for a long time, but uh, it's basically suggesting that all black women are inherently strong by virtue of uh, being and that they are independent and self-sufficient. They possess a superhuman capacity and can do everything for everyone without many complaints or problems. And so that's important to understand because it, be it can become internalized. And so if this ideology that really allows for uh, a dehumanization process, if that becomes internalized, then that creates problems with um, how we do research on these issues. And so all of these manifestations can be represented across the multiple levels of how we understand racism. So that 
brings us to our study purpose. So given that we understand how institutional inequalities uh, may become internalized, then it was unclear how black women would cope with gendered racism. And so the purpose then was to investigate the impact of gendered racism on the mental health of black college women and to explore the coping strategies used to deal with gender racism through the lens of critical race theory. Now, this study was done in 2016 before I realized that critical race theory would be a bad word. So um, it's just the theory that I use to inform the study. Um, and this is a representation of this type of study. So a transformative, sequential, explanatory, mixed method design. That sounds like a lot, but really it was a quantitative phase followed by a focus group or a qualitative phase. But what we did was use this particular method for a couple of different reasons. Um, one, it definitely involved uh, collecting quantitative data um, followed by qualitative data that could help us to explain what we found. But the goal of a transformative paradigm is to create action-oriented research in order to challenge oppression. And so the goal then is to advance social justice. So you see how it would fit in that interpretive stance or that interpretive approach to research. Um, the goal, again, is based, rather the orientation really is based on this equalization between the researcher and the participant relationship. And so it requires this transformative design really, or paradigm really requires that you couple it with a theory that allows you to interrogate power imbalances or discrimination or inequalities. And so critical race theory um, is a framework that allowed me to understand this particular phenomenon of gendered racism. It's both a theory and a methodolo methodological approach to, under, um, to addressing racial stratification through activism and scholarship. And it seeks to actively study and transform the relationship among race, racism and power in order to disrupt that racial stratification. It uh, argues that racism is both ordinary and ingrained in how we uh, think about society. So using that institutional racism or structure, um, systemic or structural racism approach. Uh, and it also provides a particular purpose and uh, for the dominant group. The um, first phase, we basically sampled um, black college women who were undergraduate or graduate students and provided them with some surveys. And then we used a particular measurement to identify the women that we wanted to do follow up with. And so in that second phase, we conducted individual interviews and did a focus group. And then we used a mixed method approach to help us understand all of the, uh, the phases as well as all of the data that we had collected. I guess for the uh, qualitative phase, we wanted to make sure we um, kind of problematize those coping strategies. And so we used intensity sampling of the phase one participants. And we also make sure to, um, when we created the focus group facilitation that we use some of the data and findings from both the interviews as well as the uh, um, survey uh, data. And so we'll talk a little bit about how we built the focus group based on those things. For phase one, these are just some of the, these are the measurements that we use to collect that quantitative data. I won't go through, I'll go through these pretty quickly so that we can get to the, the findings and also the fo focus on the focus groups a little bit more. Um, but basically we use this particular scale called gendered racial microaggression scale. And this one was a fairly new survey um, in 2016. But some of the sample items were, someone accused me of being angry when I was speaking in a calm manner. I have felt unheard in a work school or a professional setting. I have felt excluded from networking opportunities by white coworkers. And that's probably the only, that might be the only one that's new. The other one is the patient health uh, questionnaire, which helps us to operationalize depression. The Kessler Six operationalized psychological distress. And then the brief cope has been around for a really long time and looks at coping strategies. And so our quantitative results, um, we first sampled uh, 213 black college women um, and we found 
that about 30 of them reported depression with a score of greater equal to or greater than 10 on the PHQ and that 54% reported severe psychological distress. These cutoff scores are important because this is the, um, the kind of the, um, I lost my train of thought, where you would require um, treatment or services. And so this is kind of the diagnostic score for them. So that much of the sample would be uh, if they were seeing someone required services for the depression and psychological distress. So only 15% scored four or less, which indicates mild to no distress, which mean that treatment would not be necessary for that many of those um, folks. So we dug a little deeper into some correlations and regressions, and we found that uh, correlation were um, conducted to examine the relationship between the variables. Um, and the results show a positive significant relationship where uh, psychological distress and depression increases as the stress appraisal and frequency of gender racism increases. So with the way that the gender racial microaggression scale was created, it gave us two basically ways to measure. So one was how frequently do you experience these things? And the other was how do you, um, how stressful are these things to you? So both the frequency score and the stress appraisal score. And that's important because if, the strong black woman ideology has been internalized, black women are likely to say that, yes, I experience it, but it doesn't bother me. They're not going to admit to it because that might be seen as a form of weakness, um, which is not really acceptable within that ideology. And so we uh, saw that gendered racism, that stress appraisal counted for nearly 17% of the variance in depression and uh, that the frequency of gender racism counted, accounted for about 10% of the variance in psychological distress. And then we looked at some of the uh, correlations um, with the coping strategies. So the brief cope has uh, 14 subscales, and uh, I've tried to indicate the ones that are significant with the asterisks here. And so I'm gonna go through these very quickly, but. Uh, several of the relationships are significant and positive, meaning that although Black women are using these coping strategies, none of them have a significant inverse relationship with the mental health issue. Um, I will just point out that behavioral disengagement, this idea of giving up as a method of trying to cope, has the strongest correlation with psychological distress at that um, 0.32. And then for depression, Venting, or, which involves verbally expressing negative feelings or oversharing of those negative feelings, that has the strongest relationship at 0.4. And then um, very close behind was self-blame impacts depression or has that uh, positive relationship with depression at 3.98. And then that behavioral engagement, again, that I've been giving up is 3.97. Also, I think it's important just to point out that although it was not significant, religion was the only uh, item that was negatively correlated, although that was not a significant correlation. And so some of the findings and implications um, here show that it's difficult for quantitative measures alone to address internalized oppression. So even when Black women are given the opportunity to report on their own behaviors, it's nearly impossible to know how much of their thoughts and behaviors have been compromised by in internalized um, uh, gendered racism. And so again, if you believe in this idea of the strong black woman ideology, then that impacts how you view your, the, how you might view yourself as well as um, what you might do in terms of coping. And so this suggests that the uh, quantitative measures alone really are inadequate in helping us to understand how uh, marginalized communities might cope. So I'm going to go kind of quickly through this slide. Um, this helps us to understand what we did to get to the qualitative um, phase. But basically we you know, attended to representation and credibility. We did some member checking. We allowed for uh, reflexive memoing uh, and observation notes. And then we transcribed the interviews. Uh, we conducted a narrative analysis, which is a use of story to understand and honor the lived experiences. Um, uh, that the uh, participants told. 
And then we uh, use that gender racism microaggression scale to select who we wanted to have in the focus group. And so based on the, some of the commonalities between the things they were saying in the uh, individual interviews, we asked those folks to come back for the focus group. But findings from the uh, interviews included um, several uh, things. I only get into the ones that we kind of followed up with the focus group with. And, and these are the ones that were pretty common across all of the participants. And so we saw that um, there were many experiences of uh, the help. So being viewed as the help themselves, there were lots of experiences of sexual violence and physical violence. Um, and then how they were coping was a use of education. This came out in the interview, but not in the, uh, in the survey because that was not one of the items listed on the survey. So uh, some of the challenges to using an interview is that you might be reproducing this unequal power relationship. So feminist researchers suggest that by doing an individual interview that you're still kind of reproducing that one-to-one -one balance and that you can shift that by having a more focus group members and kind of that offsets that balance that you might have at a one-on-one -on -one level. And so there's also group security so you might be more comfortable to dig into some of the items that you uh, would not feel comfortable with in an individual interview because it's more focused and about you, whereas the group security might provide you the opportunity to say, well, this you know, happened to myself or and then other people can pick up and describe it or um, that this happened to you know, someone else that you know. So there's additional group uh, security that happens within the uh, focus group that doesn't happen in the interviews. And so when we conducted the focus group, um, there were, uh, again, so the things that we decided to talk about were the things that they tended to have in common based on those interviews, which was they use education to cope. And so the focus group revealed that because of the normalized nature of gendered racism, um, I have this coping in uh, quotation marks, uh, I think this is important to say that really they didn't like the term coping. So here's one example of how I had to be adaptable even within the focus group. They felt like because gender racism was so normalized that they weren't really coping with it. They just, this is how they took care of themselves. So we kind of shifted that language to self-care, caretaking strategies, um, and they were more okay with that rather than calling it coping. Um, but we certainly saw that there is a, uh, attention to education as a way to cope. Um, and so although that brief cope um, is an established measure in mental health research, it's been used since the 90s, uh, the findings from these uh, 12 interviews and the focus group reveal strategies that were not included on the, uh, on the instrument. And so the participants really talked about how they sought out academic classes, they watched documentaries, and used, even used the interviews themselves as a way to understand this issue. So they said after they saw the survey, they thought, I want to be a part of the of the interview. And so several reached out, even some that we weren't able to do the individual interviews with. We um, reached out because they wanted to continue to learn about this. So we looked in the literature and realized that this is really different from education, just kind of a general way of thinking about education. It's really more of this consciousness raising. And so this is refers to a transformative learning where the oppressed experience deconstructing or demythicizing their reality in order to develop a critical consciousness of their world. And so this is a deliberative strategy that employs a political framework, such as providing a safe learning environment for critical reflection in order for a change to occur. We also saw that social support and sense of humor were really important um, as ways of coping within this group, but not just, I don't think this would have come out in the survey because it really required this consciousness raising before the social support and the sense of humor seemed to be effective for them or seemed to provide them with some um, uh, kind of relief. So it wasn't until we saw how it was used in the focus group um, and saw how they really deconstructed their understanding of the things that they were experiencing um, and then that is when they would start to trust each other more and build that sense of support. And then I saw humor being used even within that focus group. For example, there were several instances of being uh, viewed as the help. Uh, and so in, although it was a question on the survey and although we talked about it in the interview, 
there was very much some skepticism about it still. So it's like, you know, this is weird. They just had like, okay, this is weird. Why are we talking about this? But it wasn't until we were in the focus group that they saw, oh my God, this happens to you too. Like if I'm shopping at Target, I'm wearing a sundress and flip-flops, but people are still asking me, you know, can you show me where, where this might be? Or do you know how much this costs? And so particularly Target stood out because it requires a uniform. So there was a lot of conversation about why are people viewing them as a help, um, as the help? And so it wasn't until that focus group setting that we were able to talk about where this idea comes from, how Black women as domestic workers and how Black women have been uh, viewed over time, have been used and viewed over time, and how that might still be coming into play here. And so then they were able to understand it, laugh about it, and build support around it because they were able to see that it was not just them. Before the focus group, they were, they were talking about how it gets on their nerves. They didn't really understand it. It was frustrating. Um, similarly, when you're thinking about um, sexual violence, it was, I wanted to let them lead the way on how comfortable they talked about uh, experiencing sexual violence and physical violence. Specifically, that was re uh, related to uh, gendered racism. And so they felt more comfortable talking about things that were, um, I guess, more surface level, although um, it's still quite um, harmful, I think. But one interview described how uh, they wanted to party as a freshman. They wanted to party with white fraternities on campus and um, how that required them to kind of be objectified, how they had to kind of uh, go and show off their bodies. They had to dance for the fraternity brothers in order for them to be allowed into the space. And so uh, they, you know, talked about this experience. And then several of the women talked about what they did to resist the experience. What does it feel like to see some people get let in and not see other people get let in? Also, what does it mean when you see that you're the only person being asked to do this, that the white women did not have to perform in this way, that they were allowed into the party? And so they were able to kind of deconstruct those experiences together, provide each other social support around those experiences so that they didn't feel like that's where they, those are the only spaces that they could have fun or that those are the only spaces where they would be accepted. Like you don't have to do those things to be accepted. And so they built their own social support and that's what they use the focus group for. So my goal of gathering data about how to, you know, learning about how they're coping, it really just shifted because they weren't really interested in that anymore. They really needed that space to provide each other with the social support and to, um, you know, exchange information and be there for one another. And so we kind of had to allow the focus group to do that. So I'll go through the uh, benefits and challenges of a transformative focus group, some of which um, we've talked about a little bit, but really we understood that that deconstructing um, was most important. It looks like I updated this and sent you the wrong one. But uh, balancing, the, I'll start with what it says, balancing the needs of the participant and the researcher. So I had to, again, take my take the focus that I wanted to do away from what I wanted and just focus it on what they wanted. Also, understanding that, that scholarship and service are not mutually exclusive. And so being able to use my scholarship as a way to perform the service that they needed or to allow that service to take place um, in honor of what they needed. Um, and then also to provide positive and immediate benefits for the participants. And so what they needed from me was to allow that space to do what it actually did rather than for me to continue to focus on uh, what I wanted from them. Um, most importantly, I think, is this deconstructing the normative experiences. Because without that focus group setting, I think the, the individuals, the, the participants in the study would have continued to internalize these things. They were uh, internalizing. It was making them frustrated. It was making them not visit certain spaces because of it. Um, and so really allowing them the space to deconstruct these issues became uh, the goal. And that's what the focus group would allow them to do. It also allowed them to exchange information and provide emotional support for one another. And so I was definitely left out of the group. They just exchanged contact information. They kept in touch. Uh, they since kept in touch after the focus group. They included it, each other in uh, various spaces that they had not learned about before the focus group so that they could continue to provide that emotional support. Um, 
one of them also emailed me afterwards, like months later, to say that uh, even her time with her therapist was now different because of how she understood this information. So she found that she was blaming herself less because of the, uh, the things that she learned and the experience of the focus group. And then finally, uh, again, there, the challenge, I think, uh, because the topic was very sensitive, is this uh, group disclosure and how it creates a potential threat for confidentiality. And so I simply allowed them to talk about the things that were important to them. There were several instances of sexual violence and physical violence. I let them talk about the ones that they were safe talking about, which ended up being more of the party scene and not some of the things that happened uh, that was more than that. So we, I left it at that for them. These are the limitations that you might expect from a study like this. Um, I think it's important to take a look at the implications. But basically it adds to the literature in public health um, and we talk about how uh, understanding gender racism at this level is a, uh, is a form of inaction in the face of need and doing research with black women could simply portray them as uh, negatively, as really uh, really deficit focused research um, without that focus group. So it was the focus group that really um, was able to provide them with more um, than just kind of being reproduced and pathologized as having these problems. So it was important for me to not put out a study to say black women had depression at these higher rates. And I think it's also important to uh, signify um, the importance of gender racism on mental health. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it with that. Um, yeah, that's about it. I want to make sure we have time left for uh, questions and comments if there aren't any. Thank you, guys. <laughs> That's great. Um, it depends on the topic. Um, I think for this topic, once we dug in and saw so many of the issues, and also the university has a lot of resources to help them deal with some of these things, but they were not using those resources. And so I thought that it was important for me to follow up at the focus group to provide those uh, resources that I know about um, and just to see, you know, if they would take part in those things. But Again, they really focused on their own social support system as a way to cope more than anything else. And so I guess it would depend on the topic. How do you see it providing, uh, making them more at risk if they participate in the folks group? Yeah, uh, I think that's, well, in my case, it wasn't about the same topic issue, but it was more about talking about um, sort of One example is how um, uh, hope, how do you, how does hope yeah. affect um, you and your child and that sort of thing. And so I, um, so I, I thought about it in a very kind of narrow way that, oh, talking about that as a group might not feel comfortable. Yeah. But in reality, it, I need to think about it more broadly. It might be even a better one. I, I'm glad you explained it like that. I think that was a very... Um, similar kind of thought process that I had. And I don't think I would have felt comfortable doing this study just as a focus group. So it was really important for me to select who is best suited for the focus group based on 
how they scored on that those uh, gender racism scale how even they scored on the depression and psychological distress scales and so that's how i selected the folks for this so i don't think that um depending on the topic maybe a focus group is not the best for you know these sensitive issues but certainly if you simply need lots of opinions and perspectives about you know an established survey then that that's a bit different one last question I I did not because we had uh, the multiple we had the interview actually we had three different kind of points of contact first when I uh, went to them to do the survey and then the individual interview and then the focus group but there are series of focus group and I've seen research to, to suggest that it needs to be about three uh, sessions to in order but also I think depending on the worldview you're coming from and the topic that might be an over you know you might be overburdening that sample uh, depending on what times they work and the other responsibilities that they have so I think you know again depending on what uh, perspective you're coming from that can be you know challenged a bit with obviously the goal still being to, uh, saturation and so sometimes um, I've, I did mention here that for our sample we the focus group was over three hours and so we reached saturation. I used that time because we had, you know, we spent about 20 minutes with the food and the music. And then we actually got into, so I told them you can come early for this if you want to. They all came early. And then we got into the actual, you know, topic. And then I had to sit back and let them do their thing. And then um, I would, you know, member check real time, member check to make sure I was understanding their conversation correctly. And, and yeah, it, it lasted over three hours. Now, the ones that I referenced from Penny and uh, who's done this with farm workers and, and those other uh, kind of, you know, difficult topics that we uh, mentioned earlier, they said their focus groups last uh, like the whole afternoon. And they allow people to leave. Again, this is out in like rural areas with indigenous women and, and various different topics. But they talked about how it would last the entire afternoon. So I think that time can be, you know, differently. Um, it can be different depending on the topic. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. I'm so glad you brought that up. I kind of rushed through that piece. And so I did a very thorough um, analysis of the interviews. And I only selected a couple of things for them to talk about, which are the themes that I showed you. So my focus group facilitation guide was focused on the experience of the help and then the coping of education. And then I allowed them to kind of do whatever they wanted to do after that. So when I realized that they weren't actually um, talking about strategies anymore, I decided that I might have to do a different type of analysis with this. Now, I did, uh, I did not do a uh, transcription for them. I simply recorded it and listened to it multiple times. And I did what's called an interactional analysis, which allowed me to kind of think about the interaction that the participants were having with each other. I also included uh, and made and included my observation notes during the focus group. Uh, and then certainly the member checking, I've made sure to include that. So those are the things that I uh, analyze using that kind of a framework. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you very much for this. It was enlightening. Thank you. I'm Pat Carver. I'm in Group B. I'm graduate program here. And I've conducted a number of focus groups with family caregivers and people with advanced cancer. Yeah, that's a good question. So using critical race theory's tenet that racism is ordinary, I wanted to select folks who also understood racism was ordinary. And so I used the gender racism score to see how frequently and basic, and also I will say that this study is right now under review with the journal. 
Um, but uh, what I did was basically look at what the midpoint for their frequency score was, and I decided to select people from that top 25%, so higher than average that they recognize that gender racism occurs in their lives. So I wanted a higher than average perception of gender racism, and then I wanted some diversity in terms of how they scored on psychological distress and depression, because I thought it was important that they use the focus group to give each other what they needed. Um, and it was only six women, it was 12 in the interviews and six women that were able to do the focus group. Um, but that was the main point that I looked at. I also wanted some diversity in terms of uh, their year in school. I thought that was important because research says that, you know, after that first year is when you have a higher like depression uh, and issues around mental health. And so we wanted a range and that's how we were able to talk about um, the experience of sexual violence as a freshman versus what are you doing now? But the older students were able to talk about it to the younger students. And so like, it was very intentional in that way. But I think that GRMS, that was the main way that I wanted to select. The rest of them were more uh, diverse. Mm -hmm. So I asked all 12 if they were able to be in the focus group um, and they all said yes, but then because of scheduling and then I only decided to do one focus group, those were the ones that could come at that particular time. So there was not an intentional narrowing? No, not from the individual interviews. I was planning to have, um, I wanted to invite all of them and possibly do two focus groups. Um, and then make, be sure to kind of select the topics that we talked about carefully. And um, yeah, but it just turns out that those were the ones that were available. And so it was at the end of a semester. Um, and so I was really appreciative that they were able to come, you know, for three hours with me. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Yes, yes. Yeah, that's a good question. For me, I thought it was uh, important to do the interviews first because I wanted to learn how they were understanding gender racism based off of the surveys. So the survey that they took, it really, um, I think it was 26 items that focus on gender racism. And so I wanted to really hear their experiences first. The interviews for me allowed those in-depth stories about uh, gender racism. The interviews, the, the dynamic in the interview was very different from the dynamic in the focus group. It was clear to me by the time we got to the focus group that they needed support. Um, at the individual interview, they wanted to share you know, those experiences and um, Many of those lasted well over an uh, hour and a half. Um, and I think that there was a lot of work that went into preparing for the interview. So I first basically wanted to hear their experiences uninterrupted. Um, and I tried to be as, um, to offer as much trust as possible. And to be honest, I was nervous about putting them in a focus group first because of the things that might get disclosed. And so I really wanted to filter that information before they you know, shared in a group. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we focused on, uh, I think, at every stage, because when I would go out to recruit participants for the survey, people were talking like after they took the survey. So we talked about how this is a multi-phase study, that confidentiality is going to be really important. So we described it many times, even before they got in the focus group, uh, particularly we followed up with it during the focus group, uh, I'm sorry, during the interview and then after the interview when I told them about the focus group. During the interview, we used um, uh, pseudonyms and then we also used those in the focus group. Now they decided to not because they decided to exchange phone number and all that information. Um, they also did not share the things that they talked about in the focus group, I feel like were things that they were comfortable sharing publicly. Um, and so I think even though, of course, I talked to them about confidentiality, please don't share this information with anyone beyond this room. Um, by the time they left that room, they felt very comfortable with each other. But I think that that is um, 
that's a tricky, you know, part of focus group is how do you, um, uh, how you set it up and what topic you're talking about. Like, I certainly did not feel comfortable getting deeper into, you know, experiences of physical and sexual violence. Um, and I wanted to see where they led it. So I really allowed them to disclose how much they wanted to uh, based on that issue. I have a question. Yes. Um, I know a lot of us are working with rural populations. Mm -hmm. And so um, I guess the biggest challenge is everyone in the small town. They know, know each everyone. other. That's right. Um, you know everyone's kids. You know everyone's spouses. So what if I know you're talking about doing focus groups in a series kind of over time. So what kind of strategies can you provide for us about retention, how to make sure those people continue to come to those sessions? That's a really good question. I think it ba really re based on my reading and some of the examples that I pulled from, they gave the sample what they wanted and that's what kept them coming back. And one of the ways that they incentivized or compensated the sample was that they would do their grocery shopping for them. So if you come, and so again, it changes how the IRB process from like a simple gift card or a raffle for a gift card. But if you come this week, then I provide their groceries. And that I thought that was really fascinating. So I think it's about listening to the sample and hearing what it is that would um, uh, engage them. And also the topic, like I found that talking about gendered racism, for these women, they had not had, they had not, it's heard that word. They knew what it was and they talked about how, oh, obviously I understand what this is, but they had not used that language before. And simply bringing up the topic in a validated and a research format want, made them want to come back and continue talking about it. Uh, but again, that was just one. Uh, one uh, but I think uh, even then there were several that were like, are we getting together again? And I'll say, when I say transformative, that implies that some more action took place. And so basically what we did was presented this study back to the student orgs that we recruited from. We also presented it to um, student affair um, professionals. And we partnered with the Women and Gender Resource Center to create a space where they could continue to come back to. And not just those women, but for uh, women in general that are students here, uh, the Women and Gender Resource Center created a, a, a safe space for Black college women to come and talk about the topics that they deemed important. And so that was how it became transformative. And then that group has continued. Uh, it stopped because of COVID, but it had continued. And so they saw a continued use of, of folks coming back as well. Perfect. It's one o'clock. Any other questions? Thank you guys so much. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.